Good afternoon, everyone. Conscious we're getting into sort of graveyard slot territory. We're in the last quarter of the conference. A few people have snuck out. Um, so, but thank you very much for asking me to speak. And I would love to have been here for a lot more of the conference than I could actually make. I have been quite busy. Uh, last night, I was actually speaking in the Royal Institution on the subject of mental health in a digital age. And that was a public lecture. Uh, and I was so impressed and energised by the narrative that is out there, by the way people are prepared to speak about mental health in, uh, pop in public. Um, and some of the questions that we got from the audience were from professionals from other disciplines and not from medicine. Uh, but actually people talking about how difficult they'd found it, you know, 50 years ago when they had their first significant uh, episode of mental distress and so on and how things have evolved. And so this conference wouldn't have been happening 20 years ago. And I think it's, it's a fantastic symbol of the time that we are where we are. Um, the disadvantage of speaking at this stage in a conference is you get the sneaky feeling, particularly when you haven't been there for the whole lot, you get a sneaky feeling that everybody said the good bits already. Um, so we've got the wake, we've got the uh, NHS long-term plan uh, last week launched. So we'll touch a bit on that because I think it is very important for this topic. Um, I saw that Stuart Mercer has played such a key role here and um, the long-term plan was in English plan for spending a lot of money for the NHS over the next five years or so. But this is a four-nation challenge. It certainly isn't in English and certainly not a London-centric challenge. And so, and our college is a four-nation college. So I'm going to try not to repeat large swathes. Um, so I won't talk about the Deep End project because I'm assuming you've heard a lot about it and what's been going on up there. Um, certainly I'm not going to talk about the de-stress project because you're far better than I to do it. Um, I'm not going to talk about social prescribing even though it's really, really, really close to my heart and I've been a huge champion for it. I'm not going to talk about community empowerment because I love that too and it's close to my heart. And I think Paul Farmer from Mind has spoken to you about the work they've been doing and some of their research and I'm sure he's highlighted some of the strong aspirations of the NHS long-term plan in working towards true parity of esteem with mental health and physical health problems. They've been calling for it for a long time, so has the Royal College. So you've had a view from the policy sector, and I'm sure the plan has been chewed over there. And I now get to speak after two hugely respected colleagues present their research findings. So what is left for the chair of the Royal College of GPs to discuss? The chair of the college, who's a GP in a quite middle-class, affluent area in the Midlands, but who works jolly long hours and is a partner and trains in inner city Birmingham and is surrounded by mates who keep me well and truly grounded just in case working as a GP partner wasn't enough to keep my nose to it. But what it feels like out there. The challenges day in, day out of just doing the job in the current landscape. At also a time when I'm under huge pressure to be pushing forward the fantastic joy that it is to be a GP so that we do try and encourage the next generation because we can be architects of our own downfall if we allow the doom and gloom to be too much out there. So it's a balancing act. And if I were using slides, and I decided not to because this is a relatively short slot, one of my favourite slides is a photograph of a woman's feet in high-heeled shoes. I tend to wear them, but they're not my feet. Uh, in fact, they're, they're stunning purple patent. Um, and she's on a tightrope. So she's walking a tightrope in high heels, and that is the balance we face as a profession in terms of the narrative that we have out there. We must unpick and improve this area. We also must not be putting off the next generation by only focusing on the negative. We have to celebrate the positive and the amazing stuff too. So the college motto, it's always good, if in doubt, default to Latin mottos. Cum scientia caritas, and given the time of day, I will tell you what that means. Cum scientia caritas means compassion, underpinned by scientific knowledge. I think it is the most phenomenal, phenomenal motto in terms... It takes me everywhere. Every talk I give, I can find a use for it. But how appropriate for here. We train as scientists. We understand the scientific method. We understand the importance of scientific rigour, of research and evaluation. But that is nothing if we do not apply our findings with compassion. And that applies equally to ourselves and treating ourselves as compassionate colleagues, as it does to the care we deliver our patients. The easy bit of medicine is the diagnosis and the medical problems. The easy bit is to focus on the what's the matter with you problem. What really matters and what gives me personal satisfaction, I suspect you as well, is the answer to the question of what matters to you? What's really going on? And that's the biopsychosocial model. I'm, I talk about a three-legged stool of the physical, social, and psychological. I found that biopsychosocial is a phrase that goes over the head of politicians, but a, a, a visual metaphor, three-legged stool of the pillars of the physical problems, the social problems, and the psychological problems has been hugely helpful in getting through to those who don't live in our world, the complexity of what it is that we do. 
And I, I see my physician colleagues sometimes look blanche somewhat when I say, look, the medicine bit's the easy bit of what we do. You know, the diagnosis, the medicine, yeah, 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 that's fine. We've got pathways, we've got protocols, we've got diagnostic tests. That's the easy bit. It's the other stuff that adds the complexity and adds the stress to what we do. But it's also the bit that when we get right, we know brings us professional joy and satisfaction. I stood on a platform of helping restore the joy to our professional lives, which sounded like such a trite, ridiculous thing to say. But by joy, what I mean is professional satisfaction and reward. So, a few months ago, we said goodbye to the most remarkable uh, clinician, Julian, Dr. Julian Tudor Hart, GP in the South Wales Valley. He's a Londoner, born and bred, an author, of course, of the Inverse Care Law. I suspect his name has been mentioned here before. But if it hasn't, for those of you who weren't around in 1971 when the Inverse Care Law was published in The Lancet, it is more true today than it ever was particularly the challenges of deprivation. And so we now think in a very broad sense about health inequality and deprivation. We talk about adverse childhood experiences, and I'm very interested in this area and the impact it's having throughout the life course and how we can predict who is at a much higher likelihood of having challenges later on. But also the rural-urban divide. Again, I'm very struck by the challenges some of our colleagues have in more rural communities. And we talk about all the other stuff we're used to, but there are these other things that we have to keep reflecting on the wider landscape. Julian Tudor Hart had a fearsome intellect and a fearsome academic acumen, and it gave him the discipline to do what he did in terms of creating the inverse care law. He had a talent for articulating his findings. And I do say that however good we are as researchers, if we don't get our findings out there, if we're not articulating them, if we're not sharing them with the world, they don't exist if they're not out there. I mean, we, we teach our trainees that they have to publish or perish. I say you have to publish and promote, or it's not worth it. Um, anyway, Tudor Hart was also a passionate politician, a very passionate politician, but I think we've had enough political mayhem raging at the moment for us not to go there into his political views. But I mentioned Julian because the long-term plan for the NHS, health inequalities are writ large throughout it. Now, I, you don't want to wade through all 136 pages of it, but it is worth looking at the start of it. And I think that as a caring clinician, it will make your heart sing in terms of the aspiration. It's not so much of a plan, it's more of a vision to my mind, and the vision is good. Health inequalities, help for the most vulnerable, targeting specific groups that have been challenged, and writ large is support for professionals, support for caring for the carers, caring for us, looking after ourselves. We've had the uh, Practitioner Health Programme, which led to the NHS care system for GPs, which is now going to be expanded to all doctors, and we can't work totally in isolation uh, in this. So, we can't disagree with long-term plan, a lot of the big promises in it had already been released, uh, leaked, if you like, but released by government and seeking for some good news. One of my challenges that I have with it is it says great big headline promises, like 4.5 billion more a year for community care, that we don't know whether that's a million or 4.5 billion for general practice. So what we need to do, from my point of view, is nail down what that truly means. Um, I'm sure Paul, Paul Farmer told you, the huge proportion of our time in general practice we spend seeing patients with mental health challenges means that we also welcome the huge uh, promises for two billion a year more for mental health challenges. We just don't know if that's double counting the same money. So there's a lot of issues there. But it's good to see a coherent whole with great aspiration. Aspiration to modernise the NHS, to minimise health inequalities, support the vulnerable in our society and specifically for the first time in a document of this nature to support our NHS staff and value them and nurture them. I'm just conscious of time. Um, I'm going to bound on a little bit. The college, the Royal College of GPs, has a long history of taking the whole agenda for the mental health disorders very seriously. It's one of our enduring clinical priorities. One of the joys of general practice is we do everything. One of the problems of general practice is we do everything. And as a college, trying to use members' resources wisely in terms of what we focus on, we have rolling programs of priorities. People can approach us and ask to be considered to be a spotlight, a one-year highlight project, as we've done with Ellis Danlos, for example, or Lyme disease, and things that clinicians have said we want to know more about what's this condition. But also, then, we have rolling enduring priorities, and our two enduring priorities have been cancer and mental health, um, and then a whole series of things in between. 
So we take it very seriously. We've got a new curriculum for general practice for uh, trainees, so GPs in training. Uh, and that's been sitting with the GMC for a little while. We're waiting for sign-off. And that is giving quite a significantly increased emphasis to the whole agenda for mental health disorder. But one of the problems we have is an already overfull curriculum. I don't know if there are any GP trainees in the room. Are there any here? No. Ask any GP trainee you like, and they will tell you that the curriculum is crazily large for the time in which we expected, they expected to learn it, assimilate it, and deliver it. So, uh, we've been pushing for general practice training to be extended for some time. There's not a lot of appetite in government for that. So, if we put anything into the curriculum, we have to take something out. You try taking something out of the GP curriculum and saying it doesn't matter enough to be assessed. Anyway, uh, that's, a whole, that's another campaign and it's another conference speech. Personalisation of care is what I want to finish with. I call personalisation of care Enid-shaped care after a speech I gave where I used an example of my really lovely <coughs> patient, Enid, and I'd known Enid for a long time. I'm not going to give you the whole Enid-shaped care speech because a lot of people in this room know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but how, by recommending a social initiative, a local initiative, I helped... Um, a lady who was increasingly demanding on our service, causing increased stress. And in fact, it was quite thoughtless comment made by one of my colleagues about, we got to sort Enid, that made me actually stop and spend a bit longer with her and delve a bit deeper and try to unpick what was really going on. And I use social prescribing, if you like. Uh, I helped her on the path to improvement. And in this case, her issue was loneliness. Not social isolation, but loneliness, the subjective feeling that follows after the pain of grief has passed. The subjective feeling of loneliness when your life has changed in a different direction. The loneliness of no purpose, a loneliness that amplifies the feelings of pain and triggers mental health disorder. We can, of course, be lonely in a crowded room. The loneliness that comes from a lack of meaningful interaction in a world where we are more connected than we have ever been. The quality of our interactions has deteriorated. And all of that got turned around by the right connection. So Enid's not taking antidepressants, even though lots of pathways would have told me that was an absolutely fine thing to do. Enid's not having a hip replacement, which may or may not have improved her mobility or her pain. She's an active member of the society, and she's out there. And she's not in my consulting room, well, not very often anyway. And when she comes into my consulting room, she comes in with a smile for something routine. So for us to be able to deliver truly person-centred or Enid-shaped care, we need more time with our patients, more colleagues in the system, a support structure of social prescribers, of care navigators, and a system that is much more joined up right across primary and secondary care. This is not rocket science. We feel it, we know it. And we need a health and care system that is funded to reflect the needs of its population, and it is responsive at a local level. So that what works for my patients in Litchfield will be different from what works for your patients and your patients and your patients. And that will allow us the time to ask what matters to you as a patient. Allow us the time to focus on that, not just the what's the matter with them. We're quite good at what matters with them. But that will give us personal satisfaction. It will reduce burnout. It will increase our joy in being professionals. And as technology plays a greater and greater role in the healthcare system, we must not allow it to replace the human factor. Let's use technology for what it's great at. Crunch the numbers, give us the information before the patient walks through the door. And let's use that time that it frees up and creates to deliver great care. So finally, I'm going to finish, because I have had my warning, for a plug for our art exhibition across the road. So those of you who don't know, the Royal College of GPs is quite literally a stone's throw from this building, directly across the road on your way back to Euston Station. And we've got a great space in the college, and we use our space, our white walls, if you like, for art exhibitions that are free to the public to attend, not just free for members, but free for anybody. And they always have a medical theme, quite appropriately. And at the moment, we've got a really special one that seems very relevant for today. It's called Wowie, What Was Once Imagined. And it's made by textile artist, a textile artist, Susie, uh, whose best friend is a GP. They grew up together. And between the two of them, Liz and Susie, create the most amazing art made of pills and packets and medications. Um, and all of every piece has a major story related to it. Now, Susie has had several mental health problems herself, and so quite a few of the pieces are directly relevant to mental health. So if you have time to kill before you get the train home, on, on your way back, uh, do pop in and have a look. There are about over 30 pieces. They're all within 50 yards of entering the building, so it's quite a fun thing to do. So thank you very much. I think I'm just about finishing on time. Um, looking forward to the conversation. Thank you very Bye. much, Helen.